I'm Bobby, Bobby. I used to love watching King Kong when I was little. This is my family and me when we were on the King Kong ride at Universal Studios in Florida. Unfortunately, the ride and my grandpa aren't around anymore, but I certainly have great memories of this trip. As I got into studying films, I learned that King Kong is one of the most technically innovative films of all time. But if I'm not in amateur film scholar mode and I just want to watch a movie, King Kong is also more fun than a barrel of monkeys. The larger than life figure of King Kong was created by an equally larger than life figure. The producer, director, explorer, aviator, and U.S. Air Force officer Marion C. Cooper. When he was six years old, his uncle gave him the book, Explorations and Adventures in Equatorial Africa. That book made him want to become an explorer, which he did. Him and his partner Ernest Solshak made documentaries in far off locations like Turkey and Siam. And that book gave Cooper a lifelong fascination with gorillas. Cooper began thinking about making a movie about a giant gorilla in the late 1920s when his friend and fellow explorer W. Douglas Burden had an expedition to the island of Komodo. And he brought back two living Komodo dragons to the Bronx Zoo. Now keep in mind, before 1912, Komodo dragons were thought to be mythical creatures, just like in the movie, King Kong is thought to be a mythical creature. Cooper combined that with a Beauty and the Beast motif and with the newly constructed Empire State Building that had just finished in 1931, and he had his story for Kong. But how would he make it? Initially, he thought to have a real gorilla fight a Komodo dragon in front of miniature sets. But while he was working as an executive assistant at RKO, he saw some test footage of a dinosaur movie called Creation, where a man named Willis O'Brien was using stop motion animation. Where you film it, cut, then you move your model just a little bit, you film it, you cut, then you move it a little more, you film it, you cut, and so on. And then you put all the footage together and it creates the illusion of movement. This is why I took my shirt off and played King Kong myself. Cooper thought the story for creation was terrible and canceled the project, but also thought that this was the way to make King Kong. They had two 18-inch tall King Kong models for the stop-motion animation, they also had a full-sized head, which used air pressure and about three or four guys inside of it to make it work. There was a hand attached to a lever, and there was a foot. RKO Studios was facing bankruptcy, and Kong already had a king-sized special effects budget and a king-sized music budget. The very accomplished composer Max Steiner was doing the score with a 46-player orchestra, which in 1933 for film scoring was considered enormous. So to save money, they used the dinosaur models from Creation and the jungle set from the other Cooper Schultzak production, The Most Dangerous Game. Cooper would direct the special effects scenes. Schultzak would do the dialogue scenes. And together they would make film history. It's 1933 in New York, and the adventurous filmmaker Carl Denham needs a girl for his next picture. He finds Ann Darrow, a beautiful girl who is broke due to the Great Depression. Their ship sails at dawn. But Anne, the ship's crew, and even the captain don't know where they're going. It's to an island that's not on any chart. It has a mountain that's shaped like a skull. And living on it is a creature known as Kong. After they reach the island, 
the natives kidnap Anne, and during a ritual, give her to Kong as a bride, and Kong falls in love with her. Kyle Denham, Anne's love interest Jack Driscoll, and the ship's crew go to rescue Anne, but are attacked by dinosaurs! After some casualties, they find Anne, and Kyle Denham captures Kong, and brings him back to New York to be on Broadway! But Kong escapes, terrorizes the city, finds Anne, and takes her to the top of the Empire State Building. But will her beauty kill the beast? One of the things I love about King Kong is how it transforms from reality into a scary fantasy. After the Arabian proverb about beauty and the beast that indicates the fairy tale elements to come, by the way, Marion C. Cooper made it up, you are put in the real world of 1933. It's the worst year of the Great Depression, and it looks like it. They show women waiting in line for soup, and Anne Darrow actually faints from hunger. Even though this is on a soundstage, its realism is reminiscent of the documentaries that Cooper and Schultz used to make. Adding to this is there's no film score or any music at all in these early scenes. Then they get on the ship, they set up the characters and their relationships, and they talk about the mythical creature known as Kong. Then they are surrounded by fog, and the music finally starts as they are approaching the Skull Island. This infernal fog? How will we know it's the right island? by the mountain that's shaped like a skull. It's such a subtle way to transition, because the music comes in at such a natural spot that you don't notice it. All you know is that something feels eerie. Then you get on Skull Island, and there's the enormous and mysterious Great Wall of Kong, and the natives speaking their strange, intimidating language. And it's strange no matter what language you speak, because the language was made up for the movie. Then during the night, the natives kidnap Anne, whom at this point we care about. They're playing their drums, they have their torches lit, they're yelling, and they open the Great Wall of Kong. And when the atmosphere is at its height, we finally meet King Kong. Casco! Casco! Casco Kong! And that's when the roller coaster starts and it does not stop. Because not only do you have King Kong terrorizing people, but you also have dinosaurs. And the movie makes them all carnivores too, so there's no dorky ones. And you are going to go bananas for when King Kong fights the T-Rex. They growl and snap at each other. It's so cool. Then, once you fully accept King Kong as a character, they're able to take him out of that Skull Island atmosphere and bring him back to New York, where he destroys the city. And I especially love it when he wrecks the train. It's exciting. It's scary. It's fun and action-packed. And because they guide you into suspending your disbelief, the fantasy elements feel real and have a dramatic weight to them, just like the opening scenes did. And you just get swept up in the adventure and the emotion of it. Along with the fantasy, the glue that holds the movie together, or should I say, the gorilla glue that holds the movie together, is King Kong himself. <laughs> For over 80 years, audiences have been going ape for King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. And for good reason. He's a great movie monster. King Kong looks like a giant gorilla, but his face is a little human-like, which when combined with the music makes it easier to read his emotions. Plus, it makes him unique looking, because he's not an ordinary gorilla, he's King Kong. He has this great roar, which was a lion's and a tiger's roar combined, and then played backwards. And let me tell you, this guy's a monster. He kills people, he bites them, he smushes them with his feet. And when he fights a T-Rex, he takes the jaw and just breaks it, and you can see it start to bleed. 
so he is a violent and frightening figure. However, they also give him personality. He's curious, proud of himself, and you could tell by his facial expressions and how he protects her that he loves Anne. They keep it as subtext, so Anne Darrow and the audience are still afraid of him. But at the end, that subtext comes to the surface. Because when he's on top of the Empire State Building, and is being shot at by the airplanes, and he's looking at Anne and looking at his own blood, and ultimately falls and dies, your heart breaks, and people have cried at that part. Denim, the airplanes got him. Oh no, it wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. It's such an iconic scene. Visually, it's the ultimate symbol of a monster invading civilization. At the time, the Empire State Building was the tallest building in the world. The airplanes make it suspenseful, and you can tell by the footage that Cooper and Schultzak loved airplanes, and it's actually them and the airplane that shoots Kong down. And emotionally, it just gets you right here. Because it's so tragic. He didn't ask to go to New York. All he wanted was love, and he can't have it. At the end, we fall in love with this gorilla. But in the beginning, it's the human characters that get us into the story. And the three main ones are actually based on three of the people from behind the camera. Terry Moore said, if you want to know what Marion C. Cooper was like, just watch Robert Armstrong as Carl Denham. Just like Marion C. Cooper, Carl Denham makes documentaries in the jungle and other far-off locations. He has ego, enthusiasm, and is also very much Mr. Showbiz. And Robert Armstrong has this wonderful snappy way of saying his lines, with all this great 1930s slang. Isn't there any romance or adventure in the world without having a flapper in it? Next, there's Bruce Cabot as the first mate, Jack Driscoll, who falls in love with Anne. And he was based on Ernest Schulzak. He was a strong, silent type. And there's this interview with him talking about how annoying it was to bring a woman along when him and Marion made grass. And that checked her skull all over. Ruth Rose, who was Ernest Schultzak's wife, did the final screenplay. And with her knowing and being fond of the two guys, combined with the actors being talented and having direct access to them, and they were able to capture their larger-than-life personalities while still making them feel genuine and endearing. Even Jack Driscoll's anti-women rants seems more like a little boy who's afraid of girls than actual sexism. I think Denim's off his nut taking you to shore today. I'm scared for you. I'm sort of scared of you, too. Now, because Ruth Rose was in love with Ernest Schultzak and would go on adventures with the two guys, she was able to put some of herself into Anne Darrow. When Faye Ray was cast as Anne, Marion C. Cooper promised her that she'd have the tallest, darkest leading man in Hollywood. She was hoping for Cary Grant. Anne is who we identify with, like a lot of people in 1933. She's broke, starving, and all alone in the world, and is just enthralled by this chance to go on a grand adventure. Faye Ray is charming, vulnerable, and just gorgeous with that blonde wig. And of course, no one could scream like her. So King Kong is, strangely enough, a very personal film. And while the star is clearly King Kong, whenever those human characters are there, they certainly help ground it. And along with the characters making the movie great, so do the special effects. When King Kong was released, these special effects were astounding. Now the movie's over 80 years old, so of course they don't look like today's special effects. But they still hold up well. Part of it's the black and white, it hides some of the flaws and kind of lowers your expectations. Also, because it's a fantasy, you're not expecting realistic dinosaurs, these are King Kong dinosaurs. However, the people who made King Kong also knew how to work these special effects and make them look the best they possibly could. The way to do special effects is to use multiple approaches. No special effect is perfect. And if you use the same method over and over again, like today they might do that with computer effects, 
your eyes start to notice the flaws. But if you use different approaches, you don't have a chance to do that. So in King Kong, they use both full-size King Kong body parts and stop-motion animation. Now, Willis O'Brien was a pioneer of stop-motion animation. And not only did he know how to make the models and the movements to look right, but also how to act through them and give them personality. To mix King Kong and the dinosaurs with the human actors, they would use rear screen projection, where the dinosaur footage had already been filmed and was projected on a large movie screen. And the actors were filmed in front of it. Now this process had been around, but King Kong refined it by making the screen bigger and heat resistant so that the lighting could be more natural. Also, these objects in between the actors and the screen help give it a sense of depth that rear screen projection usually doesn't have. They would also use miniature rear screen projection, where King Kong or the dinosaurs were being filmed, and they had previously filmed the human actors, and they were being projected on a miniature screen, one frame at a time to go with the stop motion animation. And this process was actually invented for King Kong. Other times they would use stop motion animation to not only do the dinosaurs, but to also do the people. Over the years, special effects have gotten more polished. But I think these have more personality, and it's neat to see how they figured these things out. Before King Kong was released, they had a test screening, and in one of the scenes, the ship's crew falls into a giant spider pit and are attacked by a giant spider and some other monsters. However, the scene was so terrifying that it detracted from the movie's story, so Marion C. Cooper had it cut. The footage has been lost. Despite people being broke, the movie was a huge hit, and it saved RKO from bankruptcy. It had a sequel, Son of Kong, that was also released in 1933. There was a 15-part radio adaptation, also done in 33. There were two remakes, one in 1976, another in 2005. King Kong has appeared in other movies. There have been cartoon shows, King Kong rides, King Kong books, and even a Broadway musical. And speaking of music, before Kong, some movies would only use little bits of music here and there. Some only did it in the opening credits. But Max Steiner's King Kong music was the first full-on original music score for a sound movie that was designed to enhance what was going on on the screen. And he created the template for all future film scores. Fay Ray became the first movie scream queen, and when she died in 2004, they turned off the lights in the Empire State Building for 15 minutes in honor of her memory. As for the Great Wall of Kong set, it went out in a blaze of glory. They set fire to it during the burning of Atlanta scene in Gone with the Wind. As for the remakes, both of them have merit, and I especially like the 2005 one. But if I can only pick one banana from the bunch, it would be the original. Both remakes follow the same story structure as the original, but they're so much longer that the beginning section where they travel to Skull Island can be a little slow, whereas I never feel that with the original. Also, they have Anne Daryl fall in love with Kong, which makes it less realistic, and it makes King Kong less scary. Plus, as great as Jack Black is, to me, Robert Armstrong is Carl Denham. He had his inspiration right there, so it's the purest form of the character. King Kong had innovations in film scoring, special effects, and sound effects. And just like Citizen Kane, it is constantly put on best movie lists for its sounding achievements. But, I think it's more fun than Citizen Kane. So I give it four Scream Queens out of four. Thank you for watching Dusty Old Movies and Ba Ba Casco Casco!